<coughs> this morning we're going to uh, return to another familiar passage, and that's in Acts chapter 1. I'd like to read for you verses 1 through 8, and really what we're looking at comes in verses 5 and in verse 8. Baptism of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, trying to make some uh, distinctions, but I think, um, again, uh, understanding the ministry of the Spirit in our hearts and how absolutely essential it is that we have it and how there is something that we must do in order to receive it. So Acts chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 1, Luke writes this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> The first account I compose Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. <clears throat> Now, just by way of quick review, we have seen that missionary work isn't just overseas cross-cultural evangelism. It is the simple communication of the gospel, sharing the gospel with other people, even people in your neighborhood, in your family. That this isn't just for the spiritually elite, for those who are specially called and trained to do this work. Jesus calls all of us to be missionaries. Uh, we've seen that this isn't something we are just to do sometimes. The Lord calls us to see ourselves as missionaries wherever we are and to be ready at all times to do this work. As a matter of fact, to be doing it at all times in everything that we're doing, seeking to communicate the gospel to others, even building those bridges that we need in order to reach them with the gospel. We've seen that to be ready. We do need to know the gospel. And of course, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you already know enough to share the gospel with others. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It's as simple as that. That we need to be willing to share this gospel from a life, of course, that shows the reality of it. We do need to live Christ before we try to share Christ with others. And that we need to seek those people who need to hear it. We need to share the gospel with them. Now, don't just build bridges. Make sure you cross that bridge and that you actually get that gospel to them. And if the Lord converts them, then bring them into the church. And I mean by that, you know, into the membership of the church. You should be always bringing them to church to hear the gospel. But try to get them plugged into a local church, into the membership of the church, so that they can be discipled so that they can receive the ministry of the people of God and the gifts that you have ministered to them and so that you might actually be blessed by them. Now to finish this brief series, and again, I wanted what we were doing in the morning to coincide with what we're doing in the evening. In the evening, we're looking at missionaries, videos of documentaries, even dramatizations of the lives of, of at least four men who gave their lives to the communication of this gospel, I really want us to see that what they were doing is, is really what we're called to do. Although they did it in different places, we need to be doing the same thing here. We need to know that we are called to do that, and we need to know how to do that, and we need to know where to find the power to do that. Well, that's what I want us to consider this morning, where we're going to find the power to do missionary work. 
That is how we can have a stronger desire to share this gospel with others. As we saw last week, I believe it was, uh, where really those who are awake among those who are sleeping the sleep of death. How can we be more awake? How can we be more alive? How can we be more effective in reaching other people with the gospel? Now we saw before, and I've already mentioned this morning, that there's really only one thing that's standing in our way, standing between us and sharing the gospel with others. And it's really ourselves. Because there's nobody standing in our way. There's nobody who is physically threatening to stop us. There isn't a special government police force that's, that's ready to arrest us if we, if we happen to come out, as it were, with the gospel. There's really only one thing that is stopping us, and that is we are stopping ourselves. Now, not all of us. I mean, not all of us in the sense of the totality of of our being is stopping us, but part of us is. That part that the Bible calls the flesh, the old man, the remaining corruption, sometimes called the old nature, as we were reminded on one occasion, maybe not the best term, but it is that part of what we were before. There is sin in our hearts and it gets in the way. Paul writes in Galatians 5.17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. That is what it is that is stopping you. Now the spirit of God is continually working in you to make you want to do what the Lord calls you to do, to make you want to reach out to others. But the sin... The flesh that's still in your soul is fighting against him as it fights against everything that the Lord wants you to do. So the question is, what can you do? What can you do about this? How can you overcome it? Well, here are four things that I want us to look at this morning. And again, these are familiar things, but I think we're going to look at them from a slightly different angle than we're used to looking at them. Be baptized in the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and keep from grieving the Spirit. Now, this is what the Lord tells us to do. And if we will do these things, the Lord says we will have more than enough power to overcome our flesh and to reach out to others with the gospel. Now, first of all, you must be baptized in the Spirit. And again, this can be understood in a couple of different ways, but I want us to see it in a particular way this morning. Luke writes, as we just read in Acts 1.5, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, I, I do want you to understand that um, baptism of the Holy Spirit can be described in, in a couple of different ways. And there's one way that we need to well, actually, we need to see the different dimensions of it. But let me just begin by saying this, that there are many Christians who see it in a particular way. They see this as the totality of what you need. This is everything that you need in order to do what Jesus calls you to do. I mean, that certainly appears to be what Luke is saying. But there are many people in the church today who believe that this is not something that every believer actually experiences, though they believe that every believer can. But they do believe that once you experience this, it's going to move you from the ordinary to the extraordinary, from being a normal Christian to being a super-Christian. They believe that this is where you need to look for this power in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there is a sense in which that's right, but there's a sense in which that's also wrong. Now, we agree that this baptism does move you from the ordinary to the extraordinary, at least when we consider all mankind, but not in exactly the same way that perhaps they do. It makes you able to do things that you couldn't do before. It moves you from darkness to light. It awakens you from spiritual sleep to spiritual wakefulness. It wakes you up, makes you alive. This is what the Spirit of God does when He puts you 
into the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes you spiritually alive for the first time, and he does this for all believers. Now, again, I, like I said, there's two different senses in which the baptism of the Spirit may be understood. And I think perhaps the way Luke is using it here incorporates this and that power or that filling of the Holy Spirit. But one thing I did want to point out here is that this baptism of the Spirit is not just something that may or may not be given to a believer. It is something that every single believer possesses, and you actually have to have it in order to be a Christian. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and listen, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. I want you to notice here the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what places you in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says we were all baptized by the Holy Spirit. This is just a reminder that when we were born into this world, we were born dead in sin. We were asleep, as it were. We were sleeping the sleep of death. We were unable to do what the Lord called us to do. We could not trust in the Lord because we hated Him. We were like, uh, you might say, electrical appliances that needed to be plugged in. We were actually made in the image of God. We were made to do something useful, but we couldn't do it. We were unable to do it because we didn't have any power. Just like your mixer isn't going to mix unless you plug it into the wall, we were made to do something useful. We couldn't because we weren't plugged in. But the Spirit of God changed that when He baptized us into Christ, when He plugged us into the Lord Jesus Christ, and He made the life of Jesus, the power of Jesus, to flow through us. He gave us the power to trust Jesus. He gave us the power to die to our old way of living. And He gave us the power to begin to live for Him. Now, I wanted to start here because you're never going to find the power to do missionary work unless you first have this baptism of the Holy Spirit, until you first have this spiritual rebirth. If you don't have his life in you this morning, and you can know that you don't, if you're not trusting in the Lord Jesus, if you're not repenting of your sins, if you're not living for him. You see, if you're not doing those things, you are not a Christian. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter whether you pray to prayer. That prayer can't save you. Only Jesus can. And if you have the life of Christ in you, it will have these evidences that flow from it. You will trust him. You will repent of your sins. You will follow him. If you don't have that this morning, then I would invite you to look to Jesus because he's the only one who can give it to you. Look to Jesus to save you. God gave him as a savior and he offers him to you and Jesus says, come to me and I won't cast you out. Come to Jesus. He invites you to come. Look to him to save you. Look to him to give you his Holy Spirit and look to him to give you the power you need to turn from your sins, to turn from me focus, you know, me centeredness from selfishness to Him-centeredness, to trust Him and to begin to live for Him. Look to Jesus because He alone can give you the power to do this. So first of all, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but again, the baptism in the sense of you must be in Jesus Christ. You must be trusting Him. Now secondly, if you are to have the power you need to do missionary work, you need to be filled with the Spirit. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now again, I do believe that that filling of the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The two of them were combined and it gave them the power at the same time. And this is really what those who believe that what you really need is the baptism of the Spirit, I think, are thinking about. The fullness of the Spirit. Now, in some ways, then, the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't enough by itself. It raises us to life. 
but it doesn't by itself give us the power that we need to serve the Lord as we should. We need to be filled with the Spirit, which is why Paul gives this commandment. Now, Paul here is not saying that the Spirit is some kind of fuel that one may have more or less of and that you need to fill your tank, as it were, with, with this kind of gas. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. The Holy Spirit is not some kind of spiritual fluid or liquid that enters into your soul that you may have only enough to maybe fill your foot, you know, and not your whole body or just part of your soul, not the entirety of it. The Holy Spirit is a person, one who can have more or less control of our lives. Paul is saying that he needs to have more control over your life. Paul says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. What he means by this is don't be filled with wine. Don't be under the control of wine. Because when you're filled with wine, when you're drunk, that leads to dissipation. It changes the way you behave. Generally, for the worse, we'd say always for the worse, because the Lord tells us not to be under its influence. It makes you reckless. In most cases, it sort of deadens your sense of fear and makes you do things that you would otherwise not do, things you shouldn't be doing. Instead, he says, be filled with the Spirit of God. Don't be under the control of wine and do those reckless things, but be filled with the Spirit because when the Spirit of God is controlling your life, you won't be selfish, you won't be reckless, but you will be more like Jesus, which is the goal of every Christian. Maybe you've heard this expression before. I, I just thought about it recently. Maybe it came up in, in our midweek study. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker, Jesus is my co-pilot? Now that really describes somebody who maybe has the Spirit of God, but isn't filled with the Spirit. Jesus is in your life. Jesus is in your car, but he's not the one at the steering wheel. You know, he's only a passenger and you're driving, you see. Well, he needs to be the one who is driving. He needs to be the one who steers our lives. When the Lord is in control, then you're going to want to do what he would do, which, among other things, is to evangelize. So you need not only to be baptized by the Spirit of God into Christ... You also need to be filled with the Spirit of God. So now the question is, how can you be filled with the Spirit? How can you be under His control? How can you have more of His influence in your life? Well, we see an example of how the disciples were filled in Acts chapter 4. I told you I was going to come back to this. After Peter and John were arrested for proclaiming uh, the resurrection in the Lord Jesus Christ, and, of course, how they can also be raised from death unto life and how they, in the last day, can be among uh, those who are raised to the resurrection of life and not the resurrection of judgment. They were ordered to stop or to be punished. After they said they wouldn't stop, they were further threatened and then they were released. When they went back to their brethren and they told them what happened, they prayed. And Luke writes in Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, do you want you to see right here, the filling of the Spirit came in answer to prayer. If you want to be filled with the Spirit of God, you do have to get it in the only ways that God has actually given you and me to get it, and that is through, again, what we call the means of grace, the different ways in which God communicates to us this grace. Now, one of those things is prayer. You need to pray. But I do want you to understand that prayer is not enough by itself. You need to read God's Word, but even that isn't enough. You need to gather together with God's people on His day. You need to worship Him. You need to share in the Lord's Supper. You need to fellowship with one another. We all need this, but even these things aren't enough. There is still something more that we need. Now, these are the only means that God has given, but they're not enough by themselves. What else do you need? Well, you do need faith, of course. 
because unless you have faith, you really can't look to Jesus Christ through these means. But even faith is not enough unless we understand faith the way that the Lord actually tells us faith and you know, what it really is. My point is that when you use these means, you have to use them for, to, to seek after the thing that the Lord wants you to gain through them. And what he wants to obtain through this is greater control over your life. You have to be seeking that, that God might actually take hold of your mind, take hold of your heart, and focus you completely on Jesus Christ and his kingdom. I do want you to notice that when, when Peter and John and the disciples prayed, that they didn't pray for the things that we might normally pray for when we get together, although we're trying to change that, and I think we've made some, some good changes. They didn't get together and pray for Aunt Bertha's big toe because it was broken. They didn't pray that they might be able to get that job that they interviewed for. They didn't pray that they might be able to pass that test on Tuesday. And by the way, let me just say, the Lord tells us we can ask for those things. I'm not saying we can't pray for those things. And we need to pray for those things, but they, we, we need to pray for them in their place. They shouldn't be the first things that are on our minds and hearts. I mean, look at the Lord's Prayer, which is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He didn't say, pray then in this way, give us this day our daily bread. Heal us from everything that's wrong with us. Supply us with all of our needs. And then your kingdom come and your will be done. Now, the burden of the prayer is God's kingdom first, his will be done first. And after you've prayed for God to be glorified, for the kingdom of his son to advance, then ask for your needs. I want you to notice that when they were praying, they were praying with that burden on their hearts, the burden that Jesus put on it. They didn't just pray for the, the, the power of the spirit of God for their own well-being either so that they could feel more spiritual and more powerful and so they could be known as super Christians. When they prayed, they prayed that they might be able to do what God called them to do. In other words, their heart was focused on the purpose for which God actually gave them these means, that they might be more like Jesus Christ in the sense of doing his will. Acts 4, verses 29 and 30. And now, Lord... Take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the holy name or through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they were seeking uh, this power through the means that God had given to them, they wanted the power to honor Jesus. And the Lord answered them by giving them that power because of the reason why they wanted it. Acts 4.31 And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now I believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit will give you the desire to want to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need that before you're ever going to get this fullness. But the baptism by itself is not going to give you this power. You need to seek for that power, but out of that desire given to you by that baptism. Out of the desire to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't expect to receive this power unless you want to use it for the right reason. Unless you are really seeking to be the Lord's and to do his will. That's when he's going to give you this power. Now thirdly, you must walk by the Spirit. In other words, having this power, you need to yield to the Spirit of God and actually let him lead you the direction he wants you to go. Paul says to the Galatians in Galatians 5.16, and this is how you break the stalemate between the flesh and the Spirit. But I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Having this filling of the Spirit, the control of the Spirit, yield to Him. Do what He tells you to do. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. 
For what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did. In other words, when God gave them the commandments on stone, couldn't change their hearts. They looked at those commandments, and all they had in order to fulfill those commandments was the power of their flesh. That wasn't enough. In the New Covenant, God takes that law and He writes it on your heart by His Holy Spirit, and that's what gives you this power. What the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did. Sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, notice, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Having the Spirit of God within us, giving us these desires, giving us the power to do it, we yield to the Spirit and actually follow Him. Let Him lead us. Now, when you ask for God's help, when you ask for this filling of the Spirit of God, for this power of the Spirit, for the right reasons, God will give you His Spirit. But once you have that power, once He gives it to you, there's something you need to do. You have to yield to Him. Yield to that influence. Yield to that control. You need to do what the Lord wants you to do. Well, what do I mean? What, what sense am I talking about when you're faced with an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, when you're faced with an opportunity to, to give to some cause? I mean, when are you supposed to yield to Him? All the time, in everything. I think you understand that life is really made up of a continual series of choices Every day, you and I are going to make hundreds of choices. And in every choice that you make, there's only two ways that you can go. You can do what you want to do, or you can do what He wants you to do. Okay? And if you have any questions to what He wants you to do, just read the Word of God. That's why He gave you His Word, is so that you would know what He wants you to do. The Lord is very specific in His Word, what He wants you to do. Now, the more that you're filled with the Spirit of God, the more that you have His control and influence, the closer these two desires are going to be. The more you're going to want what He wants, and so the more you're going to do what He wants you to do. But the less you have of the Spirit, the further these two are going to be apart. You're going to want to do one thing, but He wants you to do something else. And the more likely it's going to be that you're going to do what you want to do rather than what He wants you to do. Now, if we want to answer the question, how are we going to find the power to do missionary work if you want this power to share the gospel? which I think we would all admit is one of the more difficult things that God gives us to do because it is probably the most opposed to what our flesh wants to do. You need to yield. You need to give in to the Spirit in everything that He is moving you to do, in everything He calls you to do, which is, of course, according to the will of God. The more you resist your flesh and yield to the Spirit of God, the stronger His influence in your soul is going to become and the easier it is going to be for you to obey Him. Yield to the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit in the direction He wants you to go as He gives you that influence and that desire to go that direction according to the will of God. Give in to that desire and do not... Resist it and give in to what your flesh wants. And that really brings us to the last point. You must not grieve the Spirit of God. You must not offend Him by resisting Him. Paul writes in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, if yielding to the Spirit, if, if giving in to the Spirit of God strengthens His influence, Resisting Him, not doing what He wants, will weaken His influence. Uh, the Spirit, you know, in Scripture is, is often pictured as fire because of the holy devotion that He creates in your heart. 
John the Baptist, when he was comparing his ministry with Jesus' ministry, says in Matthew 3.11, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, by which he doesn't mean I'm throwing water on your heart, but it's outward, you know, the outward sign of water. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, I know that sometimes this passage is interpreted to mean that he's going to baptize some with the Spirit of God and others he's going to baptize with the baptism of judgment. I think what Jesus is talking about here or what uh, John is talking about is that Jesus is going to, with the Spirit of God, bring a holy fire into your lives that is going to make you zealous for his will, zealous to do good deeds. The Spirit of God is represented as fire because fire is a consuming thing. It's powerful. When the day of Pentecost had come and the Spirit of God was poured out from heaven, he appeared as fire on each of the disciples. Luke writes in Acts 2, verses 2 through 4. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, by the way, notice again, they were all baptized with the Spirit of God. Each of them received the Spirit of God, but the Spirit appeared as a tongue of fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, when you obey the Spirit of God, it's like pouring fuel on the fire that He has created. His influence becomes stronger. Your devotion burns hotter. And in that condition, it's easier to obey him. It's easier to serve him. But when you resist him, it is like pouring water on the fire. His influence becomes weaker. It quenches your devotion. And at the same time, it makes your flesh stronger, making you more self-centered, making you more desirous of the things that are against God's will, the things of the world that he hates, Making it, making it more difficult for you actually to serve him. So again, we ask the question, where are you going to find the power to resist your flesh and do the missionary work that the Lord calls you to do? Well, to summarize, you have to use, after you're baptized in the Spirit of God, after you become a Christian, you have to use the ways that God has given you to strengthen the influence of the Spirit of God in your heart. You need to pray. You need to read the Word. You need to worship. You need to fellowship. But as you do these things, you have to seek what it is that God wants to give you, the purpose for which He gave you these things. You have to seek that, that God would give you a stronger devotion to Him. How strong a devotion? an absolute devotion. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Through these means, you need to pray and seek that God would unite your heart completely to love Him. You know, one, one thing that, that seems like it, it's useful to consider here is that you only have so much love. You only have so much affection, right? I mean, we're all, we're all limited and you can divide that affection up between several different things. And the Lord is continually warning us not to love anything or anyone more than Him. But you realize that He actually tells you to do more than that. He tells you to love Him with all that you have. You are not to let your love and affection flow like so many streams, as it were, out of this reservoir, going different directions to different things. It's all supposed to flow in one direction, towards the Lord. You are to love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Not with just part of it, but all of it. Now the Lord is not saying by that that you shouldn't love others because he goes on to say you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. But I think what he means by this is you need to let all your love and devotion be to him. Let it flow to him and then let, let as it were, your love toward others flow through that love from him. In other words, husbands are to love their wives. Should they love their wives more than Christ? God forbid. But they should love Christ. They should love God most of all. And out of their love for him, love their wife. 
Out of your love for the Lord, love your neighbor. Out of your love for the Lord, love your children because your loving them is an act of love towards Him. Everything needs to flow from your love for Him, but your whole heart needs to be directed to Him. That's what the Spirit of God is seeking to do, is to draw all those avenues of affection to the Lord. And of course, when you have that, and to the degree that you have it, you yield to the Spirit of God as He seeks to control you then to express that love toward the Lord in the way that He calls you to. Go the direction the Spirit of God is leading you. And that's going to be easy to do if your heart is united towards the Lord. If it's divided between the world and the Lord and between all these different loves and other people and other things distracting you all the time, there's not going to be anything left to serve the Lord with. As a matter of fact, if that's your condition, you need the Lord. But as Christians, we can still get divided. We need to bring it all in. We need to devote ourselves to the Lord. And when you do, it's going to be easy then to do this. That's the reason why David Livingston had the heart that he had. I'm willing to go anywhere as long as it's forward. I am going to serve the Lord. I'm not going to let anything stop me. His heart was united to serve the Lord. William Carey's heart. David Brainerd. And um, what was the other one we looked at? Uh, George Mueller. The apostles, and of course our Lord Jesus Christ most of all, he said, my meat and drink is to do the will of the Father. Everything he did was to serve him. That is what the Spirit of God is seeking to work within us. And not only must we yield to the Spirit's influence, we must resist the temptation to disobey him and follow the desires of your flesh because that will quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. Let me just say in closing that this has to be universal. When I said you have to have a heart united to serve the Lord, all your love and affection needs to be going towards him. But it has to be in every area of your life, the totality of your life. You need to seek to love the Lord in everything. In your thoughts. You need to choose not to think thoughts that are dishonoring to Him, but only those things that will honor Him. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10.5, We are destroying speculations. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, not only in the lives of others, but in our own lives. Don't let yourself think things that will quench and grieve the Spirit of God. Think about those things that will honor Him. So be careful what you allow yourself to think, what you allow into your mind through the different gateways in which things enter your mind. Don't look at things you shouldn't look at. Don't hear things you shouldn't hear. Don't think about those things. That has to be true of your desires. Don't allow yourself to want things that are contrary to God's will, but only what you know the Lord wants for you. Solomon writes in Proverbs 4.23, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. You need a pure heart with pure desires. Keep them pure because when your heart is pure, then basically your life is going to flow in the right direction. You're going to be doing the right things. You need to make sure that the words that you speak are honoring to Him. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 28 and 29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You can grieve Him in your thoughts and your desires and in your words. And of course, you can grieve Him also by the things you do. You must do only those things that you know honor the Lord. And again, you know from the Word of God. That is the reason the Lord saved you, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Why did God save you? Why did he make you a new creation in Jesus Christ? It was that you may do good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That was his plan. That was his purpose. That's how we glorify him. That's one aspect 
of doing missionary work. That's a good work, sharing Christ with others. The Lord wants us to do that. That's why he saved us, why he recreated us. So make sure you do the things that he calls you to do and not those things that he tells you not to do. By the way, when we do things that the Lord tells us not to do, that quenches and grieves the Spirit. When we don't do what he commands us to do, that quenches and grieves the Spirit. We need to make sure that we yield to the Spirit as he, as he moves us to do what it is that God calls us to do, which is simply to do what Jesus did. Jesus obeyed the Father. We are called to obey him as well. Now, if you will sincerely seek the Lord in this way, you will find the power to overcome your flesh and to do what the Lord calls you to do. You will find within yourself the ability to reach the lost. You will be able to do missionary work. May the Lord grant that we would all find that power and strength in the way that the Lord has actually given us to find it. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us do exactly that.